there's some moments in life that that happen and make change so quickly, like some a car accident. I mean, it changes everything. You're the car accident. You may end up in the hospital, or or worse, being paralyzed. And in that moment, everything changes in that moment very quickly. Some moments um, are based upon decisions that we've made. You know, those past decisions, those choices that we made, and that choice itself would either produce healing or hurt in that moment. Well, Sometimes, sometimes in the moment we say things without thinking, that moment changes a lot of things. As somebody once said, you can't put the, uh, can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's the truth. In that moment, it changes a lot. There's a phrase that sometimes we hear people use, I'm in the moment. What does that mean, to be in the moment? It means that you're fully awake, fully alive, and fully there, in present, right now, aware of things. You're in the moment. It's not just something random. It's just something that you're there, you're awake, you're ready, you're receiving in that moment. But in moments, no matter what it is, something changes. Something changes. For good or for bad, in that time, particular time, something happens. We're talking about Jesus coming into this world and that moment that changed everything. You see, moments do change the, the trajectory of our life. We change. But when Jesus comes and is born in Bethlehem, changes the whole trajectory of the world, history. You know, time changes. Particularly in the West, we find with the birth of Jesus, we begin talking in terms of before birth and after death. Of who? Jesus. Times change. People have that opportunity to change because of the birth of Jesus. The reason being is that when Jesus is born, the whole world is in darkness because of sin that entered the world at the time of creation through Adam. And from that time on, people are heading to death and separation from God, and darkness, and dark. And the whole world lies in darkness, and the birth of Jesus in that moment. History changes. And people now, because of the birth of Jesus, cannot necessarily remain in the dark. The light that lights every man has come into the world. Think about that time of Jesus' birth. There's, a, there's this preparation for that moment. That's a preparation of a place. Think about it. We already read Scripture this morning concerning this, this specific town. That the one who's come from of old, ancient of days, before everything has come, will come to a specific town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem, historically, if any of you know the story of Ruth, Ruth was a Moabite, and we could go to there concerning Bethlehem. How's that work in? This is how it works in. You see, there was a famine around that time, around Bethlehem, and so they moved 
to a place, the family, okay, moved away <coughs> to Moab, a place called Moab. There, there were two, there was a whole family, Ruth and her sister, by in-law, were married to, Mary, Ruth was a Moabitess, and the, her mother-in-law was named Naomi. Now, Naomi, Naomi lost her husband to death. Her two daughter-in-laws lost their husbands to death. And so Naomi goes and says, okay, you might as well just go back, because I'm not going to have any more kids that you can marry. So why don't you just go back to your own people? Maybe you'll find a husband there. And Ruth says, I'm not going to leave you. Where you go, I will go, and your people will be my people. A famine enters, the la enters that area, and so they go back, guess where? To a town called Bethlehem. Death, famine moves them into the position of that town so that when Ruth has a child named Obed, she becomes the great-grandmother of King David. Guess what they call Bethlehem? That's David's city as well. It's the place where the family gathers. You see, the place is prepared way in advance for that to happen, that moment to occur for the birth of Jesus. God also prepared a people for that moment, a people. It began, of course, in the book of Genesis. We find God saying to Eve, There, there's going to be one who will crush the head of Satan. It's going to be of your line. And from that point on, every male child that was born was like, oh, maybe this is the one. You go to Abraham. And now this one to be born in Bethlehem is to be called the seed of Abraham. No longer just the seed of the woman, but the seed of Abraham. Fast forward. God had prepared a people, two of them, a couple, Mary and Joseph. Out of all the people in the world, you think, well, why them? Why them? But the angel comes to comes to Mary and says, you're highly favored. And a display of her character in that moment and humility and worship to God the Father. Joseph must have been a good guy, I'll tell you. For God to pick him out to be, help raise his, God's kid, think about it. He had integrity. And the whole story points that out. Both of these were prepared for that moment there in Bethlehem in the birth of our Savior. That's the first coming, the first moment that changes history, changes people, changes us. But you see, there's another moment coming. Jesus came the first time, and he's coming again. You see, Jesus didn't remain in the tomb. He walked amongst us about for 40 days and with the disciples they all saw him. At one point, Jesus is seen by 500 at one time. That's no hallucination. 
its reality. And they stood there on the, on the mountain, and they saw him rise. And the angel said, this same Jesus whom you see descend into heaven will in like manner so come. That's a moment that also changes the scope and the history of this world when Jesus returns. Not just the first, his entering, nor that, that changed a lot because we are able now to recognize and be in part of that family that we're called to because the mission of Jesus was to seek and to save that which was lost. Who are we? <laughs> Who's the world? He's coming again. Well, this is what it says about that time of Jesus coming. As in the time, but about the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be coming the Son of Man. Saying the time of Noah. Now, it, he's not, God is not saying, through Jesus, he's not saying that marriage is bad. He's not, say, he's, he's not even talking about that. What he is talking about is the routine that we're experiencing. Charlotte mentioned it. The routine of the season. The normal things that we always do. These, we, we do these things. I don't know about you, but I get, every time this time of year, I get in the fast-forward mode. Between Thanksgiving and New Year's, it's like, all right, the next thing coming up, next thing coming up. Okay, got that one done, check. Done. And we end up doing the routine, which is good, not necessarily bad. But we can do the routine and miss out, miss Jesus altogether. Missed the moment. And the reason why Jesus was born and the reason he's coming again. You see, Jesus is saying that the second coming would be a surprise. A surprise. Just like the flood was a surprise. You see, they were just doing their own thing. We, the whole world is doing their thing. And then the flood, all of a sudden, by surprise, even they have been told, the flood came. I'm thankful that the Apostle Paul speaks of us when he writes in 1 Thessalonians. He says, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those that's who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who get drunk, they get drunk in the night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate of the hope of salvation, as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, here's the word for all of us today. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. 
he's saying that even though during that time of Jesus' birth, that moment of his coming into the world and changing things, for many that was a surprise. They weren't even looking. But for us as, as followers of Jesus, Paul says we're people or children of the day. That these things that are happening in our world doesn't surprise us. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Because our eyes are awake of what God's doing in the world. And that Jesus could come at any time. Think about it. At any time. So what do we do in the meantime? What is it that we, some thoughts, of how do we respond to both his birth and the, his coming the second time at any time? My suggestion to you is when you read the news, turn it into a prayer list. I mean, how many of you, you you seen the news about what happened in Paris and in Mali, right? Turn that to a prayer. Lord, strengthen those believers, part of our family, God's family. Strengthen them that they could be the light in the dark place. And we should pray that for ourselves as well. Turn the news into your prayer list. Pray for Christians around the world who are going through stuff. That they too would be awake at what God is doing. Because behind the scenes, God's still working, whether regardless of what we see in the news. Secondly, I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you haven't done this season of the year. Take the time and read the story slowly of the birth of Jesus. And ask yourself the question, for what was the purpose that Jesus came. Why did he come? As you're reading it. I guarantee you there are some things that will jump right out at you very clearly when you take it and read it slowly. And ask yourself, why did he come? What was his purpose for coming? And then, since you know what his purpose was for coming... Now, how about yourself? Shouldn't be his mission be our mission as well? For the same reason him entering to the world, we choose to enter into the world in which we live. For the same reason. So take the time. I know some of you read it every year over and over again. You read it and you read it and it's a familiar story to you. But read it slowly and ask yourself, Jesus, why did you come? Why did you do this? Why did you leave heaven? Why in that moment of birth in Bethlehem, why did you do that? You're God. Why'd you do that? And then take it in and ask yourself, when you have discovered from the story why Jesus came, ask yourself, shouldn't that be my mission as a follower of Jesus as well? In that sense, you begin to be incarnational. By the way, maybe some of you don't even not understand what, I, what is meant by the word incarnational. Those of you that have uh, ever had chili, chili con carne, ever? Have you ever heard of that, some of you? 
chili, con carne. It means meat, right? Con carne, meat, meat. When you say the word or talk about the incarnation, the word becoming flesh, God becoming flesh, that we ourselves are to live a life that reflects him, we're incarnating. We're putting what we believe, what we trust, and our relationship with Jesus, and we're putting it in flesh, right? That's what Jesus did. He came and he moved into our neighborhood. He came and he dwelled with us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the season, don't be surprised. Please, be children of light as to what's happening in the world. Don't be taken off guard. Because if you are, you may want to look at your own foundation of your life. Are you looking in that moment? In that moment. Let's take this opportunity as we do.